Welcome to a really special episode of The Nero Show. Today, Jesse and I are joined by Jeff Linder of NorCal Cycling fame. We're going to talk about the NorCal Cycling YouTube channel, how he's been setting up some brand and sponsorship partnerships, local racing, his favorite bikes, and what he really thinks of Legion. So let's get straight into it with a chat about marginal gains. People seem to be like recreationally interested in pr- improving their speed and performance on the bike but completely missing the things that actually matter. And I was kind of thinking, like, are Chris and I part of the problem? Because almost on every show we get on, and it's fun to talk about bikes and testing and stuff like that. But really, that's not where the big gains are made. Yeah. I I mean, I have some thoughts. Uh, No, I think they are. But I think also there's millions upon millions of dollars poured into the marketing of new products because there's um, large companies who stand to benefit from that. So... What's the thing missing? Why can't you win? Well, you don't have the new SL7. That's what it is, right? Like that's the story they're telling and they're very good at selling that that story. So I think that people do want to perform. Um, I think that, that yeah, spending an, another five grand on their frame is not going to turn them into Julian Alaphilippe. I think that uh, they'd be much better off showing up to their local practice crit and doing doing reps, doing laps. But uh, but the marketing wheels are are st- turned strong, you know, and like they're very convincing uh, for people to let the make them believe that they're deficient. And if it's only for this piece of equipment, I think that, yeah, the industry is uh, <laughs> in terms of just breeding more talented riders that the big wheels of marketing are um, are not a good force for producing better talent. But should we be doing better, Jesse? Like, should we? Should we not be having that chat? Because I do feel like you're right. It's like it's a super easy thing for us to talk about. Like I got on here last week and put put a bloody man bra on and said that that was going to make me five watts faster, right? And it was funny, et cetera, et cetera. But like, you know, at the back end of it, I did wear that in the race and I wore it in the race because I thought it might actually make me a bit faster. Like, don't tell anyone. Um, and so am I like, am I part of the problem? Like should like, okay. So sh- maybe, maybe we should structure it this way. Like every, every time we bring up a marginal gain, all right, like aero bras, should we be talking about, uh, vitamin D levels or something? Like, is that maybe the <laughs> a way yin and a yang it? for each, you have like a point and a counterpoint. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, I, I, Jesse, I mean, what, what are your thoughts? I don't know. I've, no one would watch. As soon as you, you mention anything that actually matters, people are like, eh, boring. Yeah. Next show. It's like you Click can't. Clicks. It's, 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 you, you're screwed either way. <laughs> Either you sell yourself out and talk about stuff that doesn't really matter or you talk about stuff that matters and no one watches. So I don't know. Marketing and this is tricky. Is- yeah. And this is tricky for me too, because right, I recently uh, had this big trip to, to Spain where Canada was like, come out and talk about our new bike. And I know it doesn't take a genius. <laughs> I know what they want me to, to say is like, this is the best thing. You can't win races without this, right? That's basically what they want me to say. And that was the point of them bringing me out there so I could hear their, their sp- kudos speech. Kudos on getting th- that Thank trip, you. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Kudos. Um, yeah, Bruce I got is to so my- jealous right now. <laughs> <laughs> so jealous. I got to dip my toe into this world of, of cycling media, all the big stalwarts. Yeah, so what's that like? Talk, talk so, like, let, run me through yeah, it. Yeah, so I got, um, I got an email from Canada, well, for actually from Canadale's uh, PR team, um, which they outsource. And um, hey, a fan of the channel, they're launching um, this this new line of bikes. Um, how would you like to be part of this this product launch? And I was like, yes, because <laughs> it sounded like fun. Um, <laughs> Auto reply. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of time zones away from me and a lot of time on two, two different flights. Um, so would I do it again? Probably, but um, I would extend the trip because... I got there and it was fun and I was crazy jet lagged and um, yeah, it was cool to see all these people that, that we that we know from cycling media, um, too many names to list, but it's like, it was cool to go out there and like, this is the way they live their lives. This is their business model. You know, they do all these, they were all making jokes about, oh, so-and-so had too many drinks at the Merida launch last month. And it's like, there's this whole <laughs> like little click. In- it's so <laughs> funny. Yeah. It's like this whole little universe that I was a part of and it was very fun to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, it was a... Uh, it was a bit, there were moments where it was a bit over the top, just like the, this is the best thing since sliced bread and, and, and it's, 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 so this it's is Cannondale. them presenting yeah, to Cannondale you telling us such? about how fantastic yep. their new bike is. Um, yep. so, uh, yeah, get there. We, um, 
we have a dinner and then they they unveil literally they pull a sheet off the new bike and they're talking to us about how it's the best thing in the whole world and and all of this and it was just way over the top and i was like oh it was it got a little bit weird there for a bit because i was like oh is this going to be the whole thing you know thankfully it wasn't they did their little presentation and then um and then the next day we had the bikes i had a bike that was fit for me i gave them all of my details and they just had a bike that was for me tailored for me and um we went out on a ride which ended up being great um because we added on some extra and we did all these, um, these fantastic routes in, in, um, in the area in the Girona area. And, um, they, they didn't, they weren't like, you know, you have to say this or it was nothing like that. It didn't ever get anything weird or unethical. They were just like, take the bike, do whatever. They'd even ask for any content, to be honest. Obviously I would never get another invite if I showed up and didn't even make a single piece of content. Um, but, uh, but they didn't ask for, for anything. Um, and yeah, I, got my stuff I wanted, had my experience on the bike. And then my follow-up, which was, I think probably a little bit, juve, a little bit of a, of a greenhorn move, um, was, so am I taking this with me or is my entire, is my entire <laughs> video going to be based on this one ride? Because I'm like, I need to put some miles on this thing before I make some, like mm -hmm. a recommendation or like true thoughts. They're like, oh no, you have it for today and that's it. And then it's on to the next round of media people. And I was like, okay. Um, they said, oh, but, but by the way, you know, we can send you a bike later this spring that you can test some more and send back to us. And I was like, I'll think about it. But, but yeah, it was very much a first impression video and coming back full circle to where this started was, uh, was, is it good for me to show up to this? Because I know what they wanted me to say is this is the best thing and you need, you need this for success. And I'm not willing to do that. And I didn't do that. You could go watch my video. It was like, yeah, it's a nice bike. It's also cost them almost as much as a car. So like, to, you know, keep that in mind too. So I kept talking a lot, Chris. It looked, seemed like you had a thought. No, no, it's just, I had two questions. So first is what did the, what does the, the legacy media guys think of you? Like, did they, are they like no idea who you are or, oh shit, it's Jeff from NorCal. Like, I'd be really interested to know that. And that you kind of got to my second question, which was, were you the fastest there? Um, Okay, we'll take them one at a time. <laughs> the first one, I feel like most... Everyone was super nice. Um, I feel like most people knew who I was. Um, you're the YouTube guy? Is that but sort of... Maybe the, I'm okay. the YouTube you're guy, the YouTube who, guy who, who does, does racing, racing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're all, they're, most of them are YouTube people. There are a lot of print... Okay. There's some more, more print media people there, too, and and, uh, and other stuff. But yeah, most... You know, it's it's the new wave yep. of media. You gotta, if you're not on video, it's yep. like, who reads articles anymore? Turns out people do, but you know what I mean? Don't say so that they knew who I was. Don't say that. Oh, God. Well, yeah. Anyway, we'll let that go. <laughs> uh, it, um, I, was, I was definitely the outsider because I didn't know. I, it was my first one of these. Um, and people, I think, knew who I was that I spoke with, but maybe like, oh, what is it? You race, right? Um, did you, like, how did you feel about the whatever launch? And like, there was a, kind of a misunderstanding about what I did and what NorCal Cycling does. Um, so, Yeah, which I find so interesting because... Like the people you race with, the people you have in those races are are the people buying this bike. But anyway, I just, yeah. Which comes back to like what we were talking about earlier about like I'm show the thing, doing the thing, you know, mm. and they're like the, they're the yin to my yang, <laughs> which yep. is they read yep. the spec sheet and they say, how does this compare to last year? Which yep. there's value in that. It's not what I do. But yeah, uh, we were just on different sides of the spectrum and it's weird that I'm even considered as cycling media. Um, I was honored. I would do it again. I would... Um, I would extend it, especially if it was really far away from home. And um, I was not the fastest one there because we rode with the actual pros from oh. um, from the Cannondale Pro team. So I was not the fastest one there. I tried to be the fastest one there. I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna dust these yeah, world tour pros. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I I gave her the beans, as uh, yeah. my buddy Vegan would say. And uh, and I tried I tried to drop him on a climb, and I think he was probably like zone two. If I'm lucky, zone three. Like, hey, that was a good effort, which made me feel about six inches taller was that was a good effort from one of the pros <laughs> yeah, nice um do you want to talk a bit about youtube speaking of which i'm down i don't know why my don't know yep. why my voice suddenly went really high but anyway um <laughs> so i don't know i kind of liked the idea maybe of talking a bit about the sponsorship stuff because i felt like you do it it, it just kind of fits quite seamlessly into what you're sort of doing. So I feel like some videos are deserved, are deserving of being sponsored and some 
aren't up to it. So, like, for example, your, I think it was $2,000 versus, yeah, $2,000 bike versus the $10,000 bike, which was, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but it was sponsored by Pro's Closet. Yep. And, okay, just sort of taking a a broad look at it, you, you know, it was this sort of essentially like a kind of daily vlog, but it incorporated, you know, race footage, in in race footage, um, B-roll footage, you going out there talking about it, setting up, and then breaking down the difference between the two bikes, pulling out the data, et cetera, et cetera, the breakdown of the bikes. There was a bit to it is what I'm trying to say. Yep. Okay. From my perspective, yeah, well worth it. Obviously, Pro's Closet was a neat fit given the two bikes came from them, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we can talk about that a bit later. Like how how do you feel about that that side of stuff the the paid I suppose content? Uh, it never influences um, my creative choice. If they want me to do something that I don't think my audience is going to like, or especially if I don't enjoy doing, I'm going to tell them no, and the deal is going to die right there. Um, and yeah, just I guess my bigger picture ideas about sponsored content on YouTube is is I. Don't ever want to put um, the videos behind a paywall um, because I want as many people to enjoy them as possible. Um, it's a bit of a selfish thought because I like the videos that we make, but also I think it's good for the sport. Um, but there's really no such thing as free content either, right? A little bit of your attention is going to have to be pulled away towards an ad um, in order for us to justify the content that we make because... I don't have to tell you guys, video production is very time consuming, difficult and expensive, especially when we are yeah, doing a, a more involved video like the 2000 versus $10,000 bike. Um, and when, uh, when a company that I stand behind, um, like pros closet steps in, um, and says, Hey, how can we partner on something? I get the creative wheels turning. I talk with EJ a little bit about it. And we pitch them some ideas and hope, you know, some, if something sticks, that's great. If not, like I said, then the deal's done. But in this case, that video would never have been possible without them because um, it's just cost prohibitive. What do I, am I going to go buy a $10,000 bike, buy a $2,000 bike, hire EJ, you know, um, bring on a, a, a co-host, try to recoup some of the costs by selling the bikes back? Like, huh? Like YouTube's not making that much money, guys. <laughs> so the, the, that content <laughs> is possible when a sponsor like Pro's Closet steps in or like Manscaped or whatever it is. Um, I wish that AdSense revenue was enough where I didn't have to do that. Trust me. Like, I don't like the negotiation process. I don't like taking a break away from the content that I like making, but it's the nature of the beast. And, um, you know, EJ deserves a fair rate. And there's a lot of reasons why this has to happen. And I think it's, for my brand at least, it's the best path forward. Some brands have reached out and sort of starting that discussion, but then you realize how much freaking time you got to spend dealing with the just alone with the relationship before you've even made the video. Like, how much time are you spending just how what's the rate? Oh, we'll come up with an invoice for this video. What do you think of this video? It's like all the background before you've even filmed it to to get it to which work. is why like, i said trust me i wish adsense was enough because guy i mean you <laughs> click a, bu- a button and okay. adsense happens right youtube does all of that negotiating they have all of that happening in the background no I, I i hate that part of it um because a lot of a lot of my time gets pulled away from the creative process and writing and hosting and telling stories that's what we do right um negotiating with 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 whoever I'm, i won't say any names negotiating with whoever about rates is like ugh, like i hate that part of it um but it's a necessary <laughs> evil and i wish i mean i wish we could get big enough to the point where i had a a whatever the position would be called you know a sales a brand ambassador for norcal cycling who could negotiate yeah. that stuff for me because um you know small business mm. you, you guys know how it works mm. it's like uh focus on your core competency right i want to write i want to host I don't want to do anything else, you know? Um, And if I could delegate all the other responsibilities, that's all I would do. And eventually maybe even just, just host, right? Um, Because the hosting part of it, the part where I'm actually looking into a camera and talking is the easy part, right? That's, that's simple. It's all the stuff that leads up to it. And then all of the editing that happens after is, is difficult. And like EJ's taken such a big weight off because he's, He's does uh, principal editing on the main channel, and then he's just taken off with the second channel too. 
what we find really difficult, and maybe this is just more of an Australian thing, is that anytime you're dealing with some of these brands is they, they, they're really old school and they basically just want an ad. So this, this might be – so I'm talking about an in-cycling brand thing. So it might be, let's say, for example, like Trek or BM, whatever, um, might, might just essentially want a review video, right, of, of their, their stuff. And, like, we make content, but we also watch content. And I, I've always been in the belief that, like, just using, using the product and having a conversation about the product is a far more beneficial thing for that brand rather than – Hi, here. I mean, what Grant does on on GC is fantastic. It's it's exactly it's basically what they all want. Really, is is that kind of here's the bike. It looks like this. It weighs that much, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas that's that's not our go. We're not good at it. And nor do I think your or our audience really get anything out of it. And it's really hard to convince any brand that just having a conversation about their product is helpful. Uh, I no, I couldn't agree more. It's d- very difficult um, to convince them. Like, I'm always having this this discussion with with brands um, and partners, which is like, look, the best way that we can spread awareness of your product and to demonstrate the ability of your product, sh- really showcase its qualities, is to go do the thing that it was designed to do. You know, can we take your lightweight bike and go <laughs> smash a climb and get a KOM? That's a fun video, and we don't even I don't even have to say the big bold letters that are on the side of the bike because they're big bold letters on the side of your bike. It's doing the thing yeah. that it's designed yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but we want you to yeah. talk about how it's 3% lighter than last year's model. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And then the deal dies. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened because it's like, <laughs> I pull, I want to pull my hair out. Yeah, I feel I'm, I'm like yeah. I'm a geologist, but I feel like I know more about marketing than some of these marketing managers for these big high level companies multi-million dollar <laughs> yeah. companies it's like guys this ain't it you know like i'm not going to sit here and, and so read yeah school. and read <laughs> a spec sheet that's not what i do if we want if we want to move the needle and get traffic going let's show the thing doing the thing like it to me it's it's bananas that that's not so that's not no duh for them i'm not sure if that that it makes me happy that it's the same in the u.s <laughs> it or it makes me it sad that me. it's the same in the u.s what is the alviso crit is it a crit um, is, it, is it is it a group of people and a finish line? Yes. <laughs> right. There's I get a lot of questions about this. So yeah. yes, it's it's um it meets at a specific time in a specific location. It's been going going on f- since well before I started popularizing it on my YouTube channel. But um, it's not sanctioned. There's it's not under USA Cycling or anything like that. And um, it's not really a secret now. It's also there's no road closure. Um, there's no course marshals notice that there have been different yeah a lot of controversy around that we could talk about that too but there's been several locations over the years but it's the one it's been at now it's been for the longest and the reason we chose this i say we i wasn't part of the 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 process um but it's it's uh kind of interesting with the crosswinds and there's some cool course dynamics there but most importantly is there are really a bunch of clean right hand uh turns which yeah on occasion there's a red light but it's in this really weird kind of quiet business park area where um, they're unoccupied buildings. So traffic occurrences are infrequent and we're very good about like just just stopping the race and being like and neutralizing and honoring time gaps and stuff like that. So we can still have the, you know, the vibe of, of the event. So when does it, it is, run? You were saying you it was go, on Tuesdays, Chris. Yeah. Was it Tuesdays at midday or something? Yes, Tuesdays at noon. What? <laughs> <How> because <laughs> I know. So that's that another work? thing that gets some, that gets that same reaction because um, there is like Google, there's NASA, there's Lockheed, and then there's like Microsoft, and there's like a million other tech um, headquarters r- really close Brilliant. to Alviso. Oh. So there's all these there's all these guys who are like have these tech jobs who can get away for a couple hours who have a family back home or have whatever going on that prevents them. Like they can't just bail or just the sun goes down because it's the end of the day. So it's a good way to get out, get some intensity and, and vibe with the boys. I feel like the lunch ride is a little bit more common in the U S like there is, there is more chat about, you do even hear it in some of the training platforms that guys will sort of say, Oh, you know, I'm going to get out for the, for the lunch ride. It does seem to exist. Like it is, 
um, maybe it's just a, a work culture thing because yeah, I think a lot of people are surprised that we that we go race midday, um, and part of it might be a Silicon Valley like tech job phenomena. So we have we have like a unsanctioned, well, it's not a race. That's the thing. It's 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 a it's a pace line type thing. Whereas Elviso seems to be, you know, you're attacking the bunch. Like there are there are attempts to get away. There's time gaps, there's breakaways, there's there seems to be team tactics from what I can see. Oh, it's a full blown race. There's team tactics. Yeah, there's a there's a jersey. Like the jersey's kind of a, a strange <laughs> thing. Yeah. It's funny. It's got uh, the world champion stripes on it. It says Alviso on it. It's awesome. like a thing. Um and it was it's a good idea uh in 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 principle, but um the problem is is um <laughs> somebody wins it it's the person who's wearing it won the previous week and then oh whatever they have a work meeting they can't show up because again midday on a tuesday so then they just have it and then (laughs) nobody has it for the next week and then the next guy the next guy who who wins it sweats in it and then he doesn't wash it it's like i'm not gonna wear this or it's the (laughs) middle of the summer and it's like i don't what am i gonna wear this jersey over my jersey so there's (laughs) some not arrow (laughs) there's some problem or it's just hot right so there's some problems with it and i've had some some ideas not that you asked but i'll share anyway i've had some ideas on how to make this work which is a get a lockbox at alviso where we can put the jersey there (laughs) so people can't run away with it um and then have it not even be a jersey. I wanted just like an armband, right? Just a flexible yep. armband. And then yep. people can see it. And then you're like the guy to follow f- for the following week. People would not sweat in it. And, you know, there's there's some other ideas I had. But, yeah, it's to come back to your original question, we kind of lost track, which is, yes, it is very much a race. And I'm all for people establishing their own version of it because I think it's so good. One of the best things you can do as a bike racer is r- race more because, um I've seen a lot of people who are incredibly fit who still can't race because they just don't have that race awareness, right? Race craft. I find it amazing that they actually race because the thing what happens with our rides usually is that it ends up not, no one really attacks and makes a race because everyone's just trying to go as fast as possible. So I think it's cool that the bunch down there has managed to keep it as a race and not just chase everything down and, and ha- actually have a winner. It's quite rare. You take a pretty good agreement between the bunch. So do you not have a finish line in your your version of this? There mm. is, but everyone just rolls turns the entire time pretty much. So you can't really attack because you'll get away for 10 seconds and then the bunch will just roll you back. Got it. So it ends up, I mean, there's a finish line, but it's not really a race. It's more of like a training thing. Yeah. Whereas I've seen your videos, it's a race. Like there's... Yeah. People are letting stuff go and not wanting to ride on the front to follow the next one. You know, it's a it's a crit. I feel like though, Jesse, potentially some of that is like if we had a if we had a situation where, you know, twenty guys were almost sort of coming to a standstill and there was then there's like three attacks and it we probably are we we are dodging a little bit more, let's just say, infrastructure um mm. on that on that ride so the fact that it is it's like it's pretty chaotic but it's it's organized chaos in the sense that it's kind of a pace line and if if you're the strong guy you'll pull a really really hard turn and then swing off type thing so that's that's kind of the the nature to it whereas we do have a sprint finish not that i've ever Mm. really contested it but we do actually have a sprint finish so we have something similar. There might be an analogy here because we also have, um, it's called the Spectrum, but it's our local um, drop group ride, meaning, right, um, I don't know if it's the same terminology for you guys, but it's like if you get a flat or you get dropped, the group just keeps rolling. Um, but it's more yeah. of uh, what you guys are describing in that, yeah, like there are finish lines, like there are sprint points along the way. Very informal again. Um, but that is like you guys are describing where where breakaways sometimes happen, but not usually because there's a lot of people, myself included, who will show up to that and it's like, okay, I'm going out just to smash and I'll get to the front yeah. and just take a monster pull just for the sake of taking a monster pull. Um, and uh, for that reason, like you guys described, it's, it's, it becomes um, kind of neutralized. It's fast, but it's really hard for things to happen. And then people will sit and kind of wait for those sprint points, but then we, we regroup eventually. Yeah. Honestly... I don't reckon I'd still be riding if it wasn't for some of this stuff. 
like I find these unsanctioned things like the best motivation when I have no motivation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm sort of probably going to fall into that category now for the next couple of months. Like I hit a big goal recently and now I'm like, oh, so now what? And I find these things are like the best way to just keep motivated. I turned up last night and I'm getting my ass handed to me by Jesse and a few other guys. I'm like, oh, this is, I love this. Like I would never have gone out and, and, and done anything like this. I would have probably sat on my couch and like looked at the picture of my race on the weekend and that would have been it for the next month, you know. I just love this stuff. I honestly don't reckon I'd keep riding. <laughs> Jeff, are they safer than the actual sanctioned races? Because um, I've seen some of your videos, and not just your videos, other, it's just, it's almost like a section of YouTube now, which is American crit crashes in cat three to five. It's like, yeah, and they'll get 30,000 views. Yeah. Um, so racing is an inherently dangerous sport. So, um, so you both are going to have their, their risks of crashing. Um, it's an interesting question. I don't think they're more dangerous. They might be equally dangerous for different reasons because you get this big cross-section of skills. Um, you have folks mm. who will show up to all these, so it's it's unsanctioned. Anybody could show up um, who probably, this is the second time they've ridden in a pack, you know, and it's like, oh my God, we're going 30 miles an hour and this person's terrified and maybe they shouldn't be there um, before doing just some really slower group rides. Um, so there's that danger because there's such a, a delta in skill levels. Um, whereas on race day, something happens, people drive to the race, their girlfriends, they're, you know, rooting for them and, uh, the numbers on the, the side of their, their Jersey and they're willing to take higher risks as a result of all of, the, of those things. So, um, they're, they're both have some risks associated with crashing for different reasons. Have you ever had someone like get in touch and, and say they aren't racing because it crashes so much? Because I saw this discussion kind of pops up on Reddit every now and again. It's like, ah, I'm not sure if I should race. I'm, I'm scared of crashing. Is it is it almost at a point where there's some people you recommend just don't race because it's too dangerous? Well, um, I don't recommend people don't race because I love this sport and uh, I think everyone should, should love this sport as much as I do, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, there is a risk of crashing. Um, there's no anybody who says otherwise is you know they're they're blowing smoke even if even if you're a, a time trialist you can you can crash i know people who have broken their collarbone in a time trial right so um that's part of the sport um there's a high risk high reward there's a lot of that anticipation and that um and that fear of crashing almost almost makes it like a really almost adds to some of the excitement of it right um but yeah, some people are terrified of it, and um, and I don't know. But some people, Jeff, and I, oh god, all right, whatever. I'm going to say it. <laughs> My um, wife's uh, uncle um, got into the sport quite late, got himself quite fit, and this poor man was putting up a Facebook photo of himself in some version of an emergency room, literally monthly. And, you know, I spent some bit of time with him, rode with him a bit, and he, he almost was just one of these guys who potentially just, I don't think crit racing is for you. Like bike riding, absolutely go nuts, but there just seems to be there because there is a skill to this and it's not something that as, as many NorCal videos as you can watch and you can pick up a heap from them, there's just something that is an in innate right. skill of following someone at 45 miles an hour through a corner and not touching your brakes that some people just don't get. Is that harsh? Yeah, whatever. That's probably is well, harsh. No, I, I, I know I, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky subject, right? Where I was going with what I was saying, kind of rambling along, was like leaving home is dangerous, right? Everything's got risk associated with it. It's what are you getting back from it, right? I get uh, so much satisfaction from this sport. Um, and even you set aside all of the, like the video production and the YouTube and all that stuff. Um, I absolutely live for race day. I love race day there. I get so much value from that. And yes, there are risks associated with it, but like, what's that balance for you? Some people, they don't get much out of it. So just the thought of road rash, I'm not going to race my bike and then the sport's not for them. Right. Um, so maybe something else, maybe fishing is for them. Right. Because 
people different strokes for different folks but um but yes i i do agree that there has been an influx of crashing it, it does seem that way of course it's more publicized they get clicks they get views but also i think that something happened um where we went through the pandemic and there's all these folks who have crazy zwift trainer fitness who showed up to races <laughs> and they forgot that part that you were just talking about which is like there is a finesse to riding in a pack um, we were just talking about this in the, uh, one of the, the masterclass live streams that I do about somebody who had the same question. Like, I'm terrified of racing a crit. My fitness is really good. I've been doing all this indoor training. How do I get over this fear? And it's like, you got to just do more group riding and group and, and race practice races or just more sanctioned races. It just, it just comes with skill because mm. if you're f laser focused on the wheel in front of you, his big concern, which is a, a warranted one is I, I'm I'm not afraid of my own ability. It's the guy in front of me, right? It's always the guy in front of you. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, my response to him was like, yeah, you can't really control what he's going to do. Um, and he can't really control what the guy in front of him, him is going to do. And when I'm racing, I'm not looking at the guy in front of me. I'm looking at the guy, five riders in front of me, and you can anticipate what's going to happen. So if there is s something that is scary and where you know riding two inches from the wheel in front of you is potentially dangerous you are seeing that cascading effect and you actually have a lot of time to respond so i realize we got a little bit off but topic actually, but yeah zwift racing no no that's 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 totally good. really I mean, fast but yeah potentially my, dangerous my only thing is almost it's the opposite the opposite person it's the person who isn't afraid and this was this was my wife's uncle he he was not afraid of continuing to crash he was not afraid of any of this and i'm like you need to be more afraid of this because there. <laughs> There are there are repercussions for what's happening. Like I, I almost think that person who who is tentative will because that's all that's always the, the best thing to have is there is a some sort of um, kind of indicator for yourself that you're not going to cross. Whereas it's that sort of reckless well, person, I suppose. That's yeah, that's kind of where I'll, I'm headed. I'll play the devil's advocate though, and I'll say like there is a thing, and I've talked about this before too, which is like once you have that thought in your head about the fear of crashing, you tense up and you crash. <laughs> so I tell yeah, people, <laughs> this is for sprinters mostly, but at the end of a crit, um, if you're, the second you're like, I'm not good enough, or oh, this is really scary, or oh man, these other guys are so much faster, or or whatever, once you have that thought, just be done. Because you're gonna, once you're out, once that that switch has been flipped, you're, you're, nothing's good is gonna come from that. So, um, yeah, I think that there is something to to be said about like, um, um, it, once you're so focused on crashing, it's going to come true for you, right? <laughs> like, well, I was going to say, speaking of crashing, we did see a very high profile crash recently with with Legion. Um, you did a, a YouTube short on it, uh, Jeff. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about it because I have a uh, not a different take because I do think it was. In context, it was the rider in blue's fault, but it brings up a whole other thing around like the that top elite level um, crit racing scene in the US. What what the stakes are there, and sort of how you know what the go is in terms of how aggressive you're you're going to be racing. So I look at that crash right um, now. Okay, you don't have. I'm guessing, uh, Chris, you can probably bring the video. I can up, play it but, over. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you can play it over. So a couple of things here, right? It's pretty clear to me. I, let me uh, actually. Um, uh, let's just get. So, Jeff, your uh, take on that was the rider in blue was coming too fast, coming in too hot and was therefore taking the wrong line that intersected with. The Legion rider, is that right? Well, actually, there's two ways to look at it. It wasn't that he was coming in too fast. It was that he was coming in at just the wrong speed. If he was coming in faster, he would have made it. You can't... Once you're going to pass somebody in a tight corner like that, you can't come in shoulder to shoulder. Um, or else that might happen. <laughs> Crash might happen. Mm -hmm. um, if you get in front, mm -hmm. you have a clear line. You can take your line of choice, and and you're good. You've jumped the lead out. Congratulations. You've jumped the, the Legion lead out. If you can't make it, you like something's got to give because only one rider can pass through the race line at that speed in that particular corner. Mm -hmm. So he got like most of the way there and then decided he wasn't going to back off and yep. Legion decided they weren't going to back off. And it looked like they just came in shoulder to shoulder and then bam crash broken collarbone. So, yeah. um, the, yeah, I, I, what I want to see is GoPro footage if it exists, 
because the winner is the person who has their bars in front. And it's because the guy who quote unquote caused the crash made it through. A lot of people said, hey, it stands to reason that he was in front. He didn't crash. Right. Protect your front wheel. Um, we, we can't say for sure unless we have a better perspective. Because that really compressed long lens mm. that just kind of shows them coming in together. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It. So yeah. I don't mm. know for sure, but because it looked like he got into that danger zone and didn't fully commit. And that was my take. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if I pause it right when they collided, to me, he's in front because the Legion Rider collided with right. his with his trunk. So, but then he's also off. If he, <laughs> he's also way off weight. So I would be very interested if he would have made that corner. If he hadn't had the rebound off the oh, Legion right. Rider, there's every yeah, chance he's, he's counterweighted just by the Legion into, Rider. Yeah, into the barriers on the outside. But the other, so the thing I have as a thing as a whole relating to this is like Legion are known for aggressive racing. Like I've watched on on Corey Williams' YouTube channel, they literally have a guy, that bigger guy at the back, who's it seems his only role is to bully everyone else off their train, and they literally like in the right. video, uh, like recently. One of his most recent videos, he's riding blokes into the gutter to get them off the train. So in that crit um, where the crash happened, they've left the inside open. So I don't, I don't usually what like a team would do on a lead out is when they're coming into that last corner, hold the middle of the road or even the inside and then mm -hmm. swing to the outside of the corner just before so that if anyone wants to move up, the inside doors closed because the person will never make it. They person who if they wanted if the guy in blue wants to do his attack they he, they should be forcing him to do it on the outside then they can move over if he doesn't quite make it and take the corner so i kind of like in in the context of the crit races that legion do where they do race super aggressively they've left the inside door open here and this guy's gone shit i've got like it's my once in a lifetime yeah. opportunity to cut up the inside of the legion train because they've left the door open and and then it's like, yeah, okay, it's probably his fault that they crash, but I don't know. I don't really have too much sympathy because, in my opinion, they've cooked the lead out up by right. leaving the door open. Anyway, yeah, I, um, I, I oh, agree. I and and like I said before, I think until we get more um, perspectives, if they exist, we don't know for sure. So I was making some assumptions in my breakdown in that in that sixty second short that I made, but uh, but yeah, like he made it through the corner, Legion didn't, and. Legion um, uh, would is kind of hypocritical when they say like contact this is unacceptable and you can't make contact because you're totally right it doesn't you don't even take my word for it just go to their channel they they glorify contact um, and now that was the word I had yeah. written down yeah so uh, so um, I would like to see more perspectives I don't know if they exist but uh, but until all we can do is speculate and it looked like he got to that really dangerous spot and legion wasn't protecting the inside like they don't that's the legion line right it's it's been popularized by legion which is like you said protect the inside then swing out and navigate the corner but um it just looked like a wrong place right wrong time sort of situation and them calling for him to be like banned or disqualified is is i don't agree with that 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 seems egregious uh you know rubbing his racing or whatever people say in the youtube comments like sometimes these things happen his intention obviously wasn't to crash them out yeah, that was the other part, isn't it? It's like, okay, he's probably cooked it <laughs> with the rush of adrenaline when he's seen the door open. But, like, Legion have a big following. It's like th for all of them to sort of be calling it out and it's like now we're talking right. about it. It's like it's made such a big deal of it. It's so, it's just that's the bit that it also well, is a bit it's, yeah, interesting. It's, it, it brings up safety in our sport. If you take somebody who who doesn't understand anything about bike racing, they would look at that and say, this guy's being um, incredibly dangerous and he shouldn't be allowed to do that. And um, I think there's context that we need to lay over it. And also, um, like, this is a, a very atypical situation. Um, this doesn't happen very often. You know, we have very strict rules on a sprint. The officials have a clear line of sight. And when you launch your sprint, you have to follow a straight line. The rules are very clear on that. But it's like, but what about situations like this? You know, how do you prove somebody's intent? And and is is there even a rule? Like, is intent, is that the the determination of whether or not this person gets... Like, can the, are the officials reviewing footage? Like, it brings up a lot of interesting questions that have potentially serious ramifications yeah. for our sport moving forward. Everything's televised and everything's got a GoPro on it now, right?
Yeah, that's a that's I I, I highly rate that point, Jeff, because uh, you would like to think that if the rider in blue has like not followed a rule or has done something wrong, if 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 they get more camera angles, can really analyze it. I mean, they sh- they should be punished. You've caused rider two riders to crash and one to break his collarbone and and whatever else. So yeah, but on the flip side, you know, they're they're glorifying that type of that type of rider, just like you said, by having the sweeper who is, you know. Going off his line, trying to get re- get people into the gutter to get get them off. I assume Justin Williams's wheel, you know. And then, so how far back down the bunch do you take that legislation? <laughs> yeah, I ha- and I hate for the That's record. I hate right? that they do that. Just the 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 point we brought up earlier. We have Zwift racers getting into real life racing who are potentially dangerous, who maybe need some more pack skills before jumping into a sanctioned race. We also have folks who have just been watching what some folks have glorified as this is proper this is how the pros do it and it's like no 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 this is dangerous and we don't do that and and i hate that they glorify that on their channel and um i hate that other folks are now following suit it causes it causes our sport to be more dangerous it must be Hmm. a really weird sort of scene in the sense that like legion have created this incredible um look and feel and you know, you just don't have to look at some of the, the crowds that turn up and the interest about this. And let's be honest, a lot of that is due to what they have done, the, the, the promotion that they've managed to achieve, the reach that they've managed to achieve. And on the other hand, you're racing them and you want to beat them and it causes angst from that sort of perspective. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, an awkward Legion's, one. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Um you know, are they are they a force for good or a force for evil for this sport? I think they're a force for good. Yeah. Um, they implemented their own race series. They're implementing another race series. We can talk more about that. I don't know if that's a topic you guys want to talk about. Yeah, we'll, we'll transition to that. But like the Lions Den, you know, I made a video about that. People can go check that out if they want my, my long-winded version. But it's like my overall take was, wow, this leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> but overall, I think this is a, a net positive for the sport. But man, this could have been a 10 out of 10. It was like a, it was ended up being like a like a three out of ten because <laughs> there are a lot of things that they didn't do right. What? So sorry, uh, you'll have to. Can could you give us a cliff notes on that? The only thing I was aware of from that is that they that they didn't pay the prize oh, money. There's that or? drama too. I wasn't even thinking about that. Oh it? yeah, I still have. I still know people. I won't name names because oh. I don't know if they want to be called out like that. But I, I know people who won thousands of dollars of prize money who is, are still waiting for the check. So that's not good. Uh, okay. I wasn't even thinking about that, but that's a good point. No, um, they they put on this really high dollar, high budget spectacle event, which was in downtown Sacramento, like big name sponsors behind it, and it was it was Legion promoting this event. They were they were race promoters, and their implementation of it was weird because first of all, it wasn't under USA Cycling, so there was no sanctioning body. There were no there were no officials right. there, yeah. and um, and they uh. They had, it was an, inv- an invite only race and they were the only pro team. So they didn't invite any serious competition. I would like to think of us as serious competition, but I'm realistically saying we're not. They're a paid pro team and they gave themselves an A and a B team. And it wasn't in the race. They weren't racing against each other. So it was like, okay, they get 12 riders. Everyone else gets six and they're the only pro team. Huh? Like this is cool. I love that. Everyone's really <laughs> excited about this. And all these brands are behind it. And there are a million fans, but it's like, guys, there we could do a lot of things better. And then I got chopped really hard in the sprint for the four thousand dollar premium. It was a four thousand US dollar premium, and I was, I was about to win it, and I was coming. <laughs> it wasn't four thousand dollars, Jeff. It was nothing. It didn't get paid. <laughs> it was in theory anyway. four thousand dollar premium, and um, I was. Coming around the rider um, with you know 100 meters, 150 meters to go, whatever it is, it's in the it's in my video, and I was like, I'm about to win four thousand dollars. This is a good feeling. And he looked back, and he saw I was coming, and he just was started riding me into the barriers. And um, it, you don't even have to be in the sport to realize what he did. And I was really upset, and I was like, I'll go talk to the official. Oh, that's right, there is no official. And and, There's no official. and that rider who did that is on one of the the many um, sister teams of of Legion. So it was like they're they're bros. So it's like it, the whole thing was like yikes. It just reeked mm. of of unfair. And it's like the, sport needs to be fair first and foremost, right? So there was a lot of unfair things going on. Mm. 
I've mm. stirred the pot. Have I stirred the pot enough, that guys? Is, it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just thinking because I'm going like to be like devil's advocate again. If it's just their crit, it doesn't necessarily need to right. be anything. <laughs> if it's but just some big promo well, advertising. This is the whole thing. I mean, it is it's yeah. like um, is it's almost like a demonstration sport by yeah. by the sounds of that. It was like maybe it's maybe it was a proof of concept. We haven't even had the oh, we've had a couple of those sort of things where which have been the high profile ones, haven't we, Jesse? Like we did that one at um, where was it White Bay, which was mm-hmm. super promoted, like in, under lights. Like my family came, they never come to races, um, and the actual race was dog shit. Like it was, we I think there was a hundred flats because no <laughs> one had swept this pro, this previous. Um, it was like an old container terminal, and no one had actually swept any of it, and so everyone just got flats. The race was a disaster, but we finished. And like mum and dad and everything are there, going, "Wow, that was amazing!" I'm like, no, it, was, "It was totally crap." But yeah, proof of concept maybe. I don't know, not being around it, but I imagine sort of, is it hard for you to criticize yes. Legion? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, they have a they have a very loyal following, and um, it's hard to criticize them. I that was one of the few videos I usually just turn the ca- turn the camera on, turn the the um, turn the mic on, and then just rip it. Right. That was one of the few ones where I was like, I got to be very careful because um, it's a very sensitive subject. Anytime you you issue any criticism to the, um, the Legion organization, um, you got to be very careful for a number of reasons. And and one comes back to what we were talking about earlier. Are they a force for good or force for evil for the sport? I think overall good. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, like their race, Jesse had made a good point. Like they can do whatever they want. This was outside the bounds of any sanctioning organization. They could, they could have given themselves four teams, but this comes back to that original question. Is this good or bad for the sport? Because if it's not fair, nobody wants to come back. If it's not a good, enjoyable experience yeah. for the fans, um, they don't. people don't want to come back. And I don't know what the average fan would be interested in. Do they just want to see the Williams brothers just line up with 12 teammates in front of them and just absolutely murder the sprint? To me, that's not exciting. I would want to see them battle against Team Rally or like somebody who is going to go toe-to-toe with them. And then, by the way, the way racing works is that that's going to open the door for the second tier teams, right? Because you let the big boys duke it out and then maybe we can do our thing. So, so that makes the racing so much more dynamic. And, and it's a, the, the sport is in flux right now um, in the United States, especially crit racing, right? We have their crit series. I think it's just called crit. <laughs> we know very little about it, um, except it's coming. Um, and hopefully they'll be, <laughs> they'll do a little bit better of a job and there's, might be It'll prize be, money, be prize some, money, some better implementation of it. There's NCL, which I'll be making a video about. I had some teammates who went. I couldn't make the first one in in Miami Beach. That was pretty cool. Um, and then there's, mm-hmm. yep, that was streamed, that was streamed on, on GCN. GCN. We got to yeah, that. Uh, and they had. We could talk more about that. I think there's a lot of cool things that a lot of these different groups are doing. Um, and then there's uh, the ACC, which is the USA Crits, kind of filled in for the USA Crits, um, which is. American Cycling Championship, I think, something like that. They are putting on, they are now picking up um, those big crit races that people think about that have been around for, for 50, 50 years in some cases. So so there are these com- three competing things and it's like, there's, there's just a weird period right now for crit racing, especially in the United States. You know what I think is really cool what they're doing? And they did this at the Into the Lion's Den too, was um, the teams are regional. It has a very much a, a pro you know, basketball or, or baseball or football or whatever um, vibe to it. We're like, yeah, I was on Mike's bikes and I had my Mike's bikes teammates, but we were racing as like the Bay Area Nuggets or whatever our team name was, right? We were given the team name. We were given the jerseys. I had an actual like jersey, right? Like a basketball. I mean, it was a cycling yeah, jersey, but it had my name yeah, on yeah, it yeah. and it had a number yeah. on it. Like it was kind of cool. I still have it. I think it's, I think that was fun and it's like so much, um, so much more fun for the fans to, to see, oh, he's got a, a name on his back and like he's from a place, you know, and you can be like, oh. So how did that work with Mike's bikes? Because, you know, we've both been in racing long enough and run teams that like, hang on, I where is, where is my sponsor branding thing that's now not going to be on GCN Plus? Right, yeah, our jerseys didn't have our um sponsors it wasn't our jersey um but we were on our bikes and our equipment um yeah i think that mike's probably looked the other way i'm not part of 
I'm, I'm part of the race team. I'm not part of the Mike's yeah. organization. So um, oh, no, I, know that. I yeah. couldn't speak specifically to it, but I think that it's the type of thing where they say, oh, cool, we got this invite. This is overall, this is a net positive. We're stoked, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah. So do you, so you, are you just part of the team or do you run the Mike's no, just Bikes part team? Of it. Like, man, yeah. just, oh, uh, okay. What, le- what, so what level is that team? Because trying to get it, like, if you, so you race domestically, so you're a domestic elite team. Does the team have any, uh, like, goals to race overseas or, uh, um, like, to compete with the Conti teams, that sort of thing? Like, where, where right. do you guys sit? Um, no, we're a pretty unique team. We're, we're domestic elite. You hit the nail on the head. Um, and um, we, uh, we compete in, like, pro nationals, um, which we're on a short list of teams that uh, need the domestic elite qualification to get invited to those, uh, those types of events. And, um, yeah, I think our biggest goal, again, I'm now I'm, I'm kind of speaking a little bit out of turn because I'm not part of the actual organization, but, um, we have a, a unique blend of riders, right? We have guys like myself who are getting a little bit long in the tooth and, uh, and, uh, aging out a little bit of the sport be, uh, be real with you guys and say, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm not going to be fast forever. <laughs> um, but now we have these new riders coming in, um, Sean, who's been on my channel a few times, um, a Gavin who just had an amazing result at Redlands. We have these these new crops of riders who um, will often use Mike's bikes as a jumping off point to the you know the UCI level. Um, we've had a number of riders who have made a good run at being a pro, uh, and that's something that we offer on, on Mike's bikes. I feel like the mix of riders on the team is really good for that because we have us old timers who um, can kind of nurture those younger ones who come in who have an amazing set of talents and abilities and skills, but maybe just need a little bit of direction on race day. And, and for that reason, yeah, we have a lot of success locally. And, um, I think that we're, we're looked at as one of those teams for the developing junior rider where, um, they're not going straight into U 23 pro. Maybe they're going to do this as like a jumping off point. That's generally what we do. So I hear you reference a little bit in when, when you're going to, to crit races and stuff like, Oh, this guy's a pro, that guy's a pro. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And like from from our perspective, like so, there are no actual pros in Australia. If you are a pro to ride a bike, you are you're in Europe because they're the only ones paying you a salary to to ride your bike at sort of pro conti, yeah, well, to a level and up. So, what is is what is a what is a pro crit? A US pro crit <laughs> racer. Like, what's their life? What what are what are they earning? Is 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 it a sustainable income? Like, is it based just purely on race wins? That's a bit of a misnomer because I don't know if anybody makes a career um, solely based on their crit racing performance, right? It, it's the it's the evolution of our sport, right? Like, I think the best crit racers, the aforementioned Williams brothers, their money a very small portion of their income to sustain their lifestyle, their business, their whole brand is is um th- has very little to do with uh with the actual race earnings right <laughs> um yep, of course social media is like how you make it yep. as a u.s based um crit racer that's how if you want to make a, a, a run of it that's that's how it is um if you want to so find the guys on their team be be being paid a salary or I a imagine. stipend do you know i imagine yeah yeah right yeah they are okay they are. i think we can safely say that i mean i don't know what the numbers are yep. but yes um, I don't know if at that level they're they're um, Conti UCI Conti. I don't know if there are minimums. I don't know. I've never I've never that's never been me. Um, but uh, I don't think there are. <laughs> um, yeah. But the folks who um, want to make the more traditional run at becoming a pro, they will maybe go around come around and do the USA crit scene. Um, but they yeah they're off in Europe also, just like for you guys, because that's where the bigger races are. That's where the 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 leading edge of the sport is. Well, um, what sort of support is there for a for a Mike's Bikes rider or, a, yeah, any other sort of domestic elite team? Are they, are they getting, is it team bikes? Is it team kit? I get 150K or, a year salary to race. For, to I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we get, we have, we have good sponsors. Um, yeah, I have a team bike. Um, it's not mine, um, but it's mine for the whole year. And then we sell it and that money goes back into our um, pot of money that goes to things like you know the team. Airf- yeah for for race registration airfare 
um, things like that. If it's a if it's a team event, now what qualifies a team event is um, up to the team um, uh, to decide. And I'm not part of that conversation. But um, for the most part, uh, most race related expenses are taken care of on on Team Mike's bikes. Sounds very nice. similar to to here. Like the whole misnomer of a pro here is just basically someone who lives with their parents and <laughs> yeah. And works you know, at the bike shop part time. <laughs> works at the bike shop and m- might get a you know a bike or some some kit to ride around in and the rest of it. But yeah, that's that's about as far as it goes. I'll, I'll be honest. Well, uh, well, not, not even, even that, that, Chris. I mean, even yeah. in Australia, uh, you, there's probably three teams where you'll get a bike that you can use yeah. for free. There, I'll be honest. I, I and then you then have to give it. Back. I, I must admit, I was under the illusion that you know maybe maybe Legion. Blazers, is it the other the other Miami Blazers, Blazers, the uh, Austin Aviators? They're expanding their empire. They're yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a lot of their their regional teams now. I must have been. I, I thought they were like catered for, like paid, and and that was their life. But that's yeah, that's interesting. I'm 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 glad you kind of freshened that out for me. And just another thought I had um, is just this concept of being a, a pro, quote unquote, because I think pro is like you make a living doing this thing that makes you a pro, right? There's a there's a connotation that comes along with the word, which is I'm really good at this craft, which I think now in 2023, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. The, the note I wrote down is a spectrum of if you are not good at social media, you better damn well be a really good racer in order to make a a run at it (laughs) if you are not that good of a racer you better be really good at social media to make a run at it and like you know i'm somewhere in the middle right (laughs) and the older i get the closer i get towards social media (laughs) but yep but i work with you know some of these younger riders on my team they um social media to them is like how many of my friends follow me on instagram you know and it's they don't understand this concept of uh making your turning yourself into a brand almost that uh where you have value to these um, to industry and um and yeah i think the obviously the 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 best way you could sell yourself is i'm really good at a sport i'm an, I'm an influencer you know i'm a uh, a voice of, a, of authority and i'm really good at conveying that message for the for the brands i'm a, I'm a good um representative of the brands uh, that sponsor me so yeah i think it's, it's a funny place where you have to be at least somewhere on this scale right <laughs> yeah there are just so few teams that value that Social media, more and more though they, they have I mean, to. Obviously, Legion do. Well, we're in a different place. <laughs> oh, they have to. Like, now. We're in a different place. Yeah. We, we oh, don't okay. even have a. Oh no, you don't, don't trigger me. Don't trigger me. <laughs> don't don't trigger me. Over here, no one cares how many yeah, followers well, you got. That's so because the, go- the governing body don't bike. give a shit about the actual race itself or the series itself. So you've got nothing to promote. At least in the US, you have events that you can actually promote. Here, we did a race on the weekend. There's about four photos. Four photos, you know, if and you've got to like know someone who who saw the saw a photographer and I think he had a camera. Yeah. Did he have a camera? I don't know. And then you like do this deep Facebook dive to try and find a photo of it. So it's yeah, it becomes we a, have that problem too though. A whole I think other you thing. you guys probably see like the big time events and maybe maybe you think a lot of our events are like that. We just had our state road race championships. Do you know where it was or who won? <laughs> On Saturday, there was a photographer. (laughs) There were a few photographers there. There's maybe somebody with a GoPro on their bike. It's the kind of a similar problem we have here too, which is this is a big race, but for other racers, right? It's not GCN's not out there with their broadcasting team (laughs) sending it out Mm. to millions of of folks. If Jeff and Jeff or Tyler aren't there, I'm probably not going (laughs) to know that anything happened. You know. The other cool thing about the US is almost every course is on YouTube. So I, I coach a few people within the US and they've got a crit coming up. I, I just go on YouTube, type in the crit, and there's someone's filmed a 15-minute video of the course. So it's actually <laughs> the culture cool? over there I, is great. I do the same thing. Free, yeah. free course recon. Yeah, it's sick. What's the best bike you've ever ridden, Jeff? Um, Probably my, my 2011 Felt F1 because it got me from Cat 5 to Cat 1. <laughs> But that's not the answer you guys are looking for. Uh, no, I don't know. Yeah, it is. There's so yeah. oh, it could be. Okay, that's that's know. that's my answer. But that's a personal, right? Uh, there, there's that's a personal thing because I have a lot of emotions tied up with that bike. So I love that bike. My brother-in-law has it now, and and um, and there's something special, uh, sentimental value that I have with that bike. But in just in terms of like raw performance, 
um, God, we're so spoiled. There's so many good bikes and, um, I feel like they're all kind of converging and they're all becoming the same bike. Is it just me who thought this? I kind of brought this up in the aforementioned Cannondale video, which is like, you know, aero, aero tube sections, um, drop seat stays, like threaded bottom bracket, like everything is just kind of converging onto. And I think the reason is, is because physics are physics, right? And all these things are now designed in wind tunnels and UCI rules are what they are. And companies are like, we can make an aero bike that is also at the weight limit. And we're talking about like the, the cat's pajamas of every single brand, right? Their highest end model. I think everything starts to blend and they put their own yep. little spin on it, right? Um, Trek has that weird thing, the back of their bike. Uh, every brand has their own special little thing. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't work with Specialized what's anymore, the, but the, the SL7 of, was a great what's bike. What's the sort of bike of, uh, bike of the crit scene at the moment? Because like for us, you know, anyone watches this, okay, yeah, the Cervelo S5 is like the, the bike of the bunch. Is there like a, is, is there a bike there that, that just has that, oh, Jeff's on it, oh, whoever's oh. on it, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get, like, it's just it's a good, dime a dozen almost. No, it's a, it's a good question. Around here, it's the Specialized bike. It's, it's very regional, right? Because we, here in Morgan Hill, really close to San Jose, we have um, the uh, the specialized headquarters. So I feel like you see a lot of specialized bikes around here. So yeah, like the SL7, there are a lot of people who um, who love the Venge. I'm, I'm, put me in that category. I loved the Venge. It's uh, now discontinued, obviously. that's a, That was a great bike, still is a great bike. Um, so you see that around quite a bit with some, some good crit racers. But now the big thing locally is... Uh, I see a lot of really good racers, my teammates, um, a handful of them, but then some other big crit guys are on the, um, yeah, the, the S5, which, uh, uh, they, they talk a lot about it. Um, and they're not sponsored. They're not paid to, <laughs> to race the bike, but they absolutely love it. I haven't, um, had an opportunity to ride it. I'm on the soloist, which is a great bike too. Are you seeing any rim brake pushback? Uh, the only reason I say that is again, on the weekend, I really noticed it. I noticed a good, I mean, different Different race, 230K is not a crit, but a serious pushback of, I reckon, a third of the field um, going at, okay, I'm going to build a lightweight rim brake bike. Right. Um, yeah, I have, I, have, um, I have thoughts on the whole rim and disc um, controversy, I guess we'd call it, or, or debate, um, which are, are not terribly exciting, thoughts but um i'll share them anyway which is like it doesn't really matter all that much um disc brakes stop better um especially under difficult uh conditions right if it's raining um they stop better <laughs> like <laughs> that's what they're designed to do they stop better uh and if you're trying to squeeze out performance s delaying breaking into a corner means you're going to be faster so there's a performance benefit there at what cost they weigh more um, so there's a balancing act there. This is, uh, we're guys, we're doing it right now. We're talking about marginal gains. We, we've become the thing we, we, yeah, the we're doing it. The whole right. thing. Um, <laughs> we're talking blood tests next. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they weigh a bit more. Does this, can you win a race on, on rim brakes? Yes. Can you win a race on disc brakes? Yes. Like it doesn't matter all that much to me. What I've said for folks is, if you have nice carbon race wheels that are um, rim brakes, then probably stay on rim brakes. Probably that make that the, the deciding factor. Um, but uh, an interesting thought, and then we can we can move on. Is um, there's a weird thing, not so much anymore, but a couple years back, where the the professional peloton had mixed, where you had some guys on discs, some guys on rim. I think it's all rim or all disc now, right? Or at least close to it. Yep. Maybe yep. one holdout team or something, but. It start to rain, and now you have varying braking performance. If everyone is s slow to brake, you're fine. It's a school of fish. If you have people who are in front of you who are on uh, disc brakes who are slowing down faster, we got big problems. So that was a thought that I had, but I think now, uh, now the whole peloton is pretty much on disc. Yep. No, I totally agree. Um, I yeah. actually the, the analogy I sort of use a little bit. It's the um, the influx of electric cars. It's actually changed the way a traffic flows because the torque is so high in an electric car, and they just. Whoop, take off that now you'll see it when a, a sort of line of traffic restarts from a from a um, traffic light or something like that it's completely altered the flow of of how traffic moves and it's actually slowed things down because cars now accelerate at such a different 
speed with like this slow influx of, of electric cars. There you go. Didn't know you get some electric car content <laughs> today, but you did. Reaching new audiences. I like that. Reaching new audiences. Yeah. You, you brought up felt, Jeff. We don't really get felt in Australia, at least not in the road market. I think I've seen a few felt triathlon bikes. What, where's felt sitting they, um, in the hierarchy? They were big for a long time. They sponsored the, um, or they were a provider for the uh, national team for, for many years. They even might still be for like track or something like that. Um, they were a big American brand for a number of years. I, they kind of fell out of popularity. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, sales marketing team, maybe. Um, hard, hard to say. I'd just be speculating. But um, I guess recently I heard they got bought up by a much bigger, you know, conglomerate corporation. Um, so I guess they're they're revamping their brand. They're coming out with some new designs, and um, seems like they're trying to get back in the in the hunt, get some more of that market share back. But uh, for for many years they were yeah they were big time big time brand um, here in the states. I feel like they've fallen out of favor to to your your treks and your specialized and your giants. They always look like they tried different things, a little different approach, and they had that cool hexagonal yeah. or the the check checkered uh, carbon layout, which always looked cool. Yeah, it's a shame we don't. A bit like see Cube them here. for me. Felt and Cube seem to be like these two brands that we don't get here. Well, Cube in the in Europe and Felt in in the US, where they just don't quite travel. Maybe. What do you know. guys have? What's like the biggest uh, biggest bike that you see? You guys asked me. I said specialized here, Midwest. It's Trek. What do you guys see down under? Uh, giant. Yeah, it's it's really the stores. So you'll have like specialized stores, giant stores. Yeah, uh, and and then um, the the Cervelo Cannondale, right. that's Pawn hybrid, right? and that's yeah, that's, that's like all the, the same three. company now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they 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 had heaps of stock during COVID, so they're all over the place. Yeah, and every everything. Oh, and and Pinarello as well seemed to have really good stock. So at least in Sydney, Pinarello's surprisingly big, given how expensive they are. Um, Are people mostly um, SRAM Shimano? Yeah, very much. Yes, a lot of sh a lot of again, like a surprisingly large amount of SRAM. Given that, like majority, well, more like more Shimano SRAM is... than because I'd say it's pretty split Ooh. here. Oh. Maybe more, maybe oh, more. I SRAM. wouldn't want to. I mean, if we're talking, let's 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 just let's just break it down to to people who are turning up to do crit races, like. I would say it's almost 50-50 with SRAM yeah. versus Shimano across the across the maybe three or four grades. Um, you know, with your one or two campy mechanical group sets thrown in for a good measure, who's probably on a Colnado, right? Some or a custom build, yeah. So um, it's uh, it. Well, you only see more Shimano because SRAM mechanical doesn't really exist on the road, so. That lower end is all Shimano, but at at anyone running like 105 or above, it's yeah, it's like almost equal. I would say just from off the top of my head, seeing people riding around Centennial Park if they're on SRAM or right. Shimano, it sounds about the same here. And then you'll get your your every your occasional uh, campy that you'll see around here. It sounds sounds very similar. We're pretty much split too. It's surprising that SRAM um, is so popular or has gained so much popularity in a relatively small. I think a lot of thing, a lot of it was that was that. Um, the, the COVID stock stuff. I mean, it was. It was easier to get force group sets than than Altegra for a almost two years. Like, and it's hard to. It's hard once you once you make the shift. Yeah, uh -huh. I see what you did there. It's um, it's pretty. See what I did? <laughs> Professional. Um, yeah. It's <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to go back. So I reckon we I reckon we just finish up with um. Oh, so I reckon we finish up. One question for you, Jeff. Will EJ make it to Cat 1 this cat season? One. Cat 2. Okay, okay. Because I was going to say no to Cat 1. Cat 2, I think he will. I think he will. Okay. I'm going to make the prediction. And also, Jesse's he's going to double his FTP. <laughs> 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 I think he will. Well, so what's he about? 20? Last time I checked, I think he was at 3. Something, three something like that. And he needs to get to he, 380. So he he probably might. he's do hitting it. that spot, oh, right? Of diminishing funny. returns. Um, I mean, he's he's been there for for a while, but uh, but yeah, man, the guy is a beast. He's he's obviously very motivated, very dedicated to the sport. Um, 
he can knock out those training plans like nobody's business. It's really working out for him. He adapts well to the training stress. The last piece of the puzzle that is the only thing holding him back from being a cat one, because I think he's got the power, right? He makes 1500 watts and he has a 360 watt FTP. He's been in this sport guys for, for months, not even years. It's pretty insane. You know, baseball background, right? Like he was a pitcher. He was an overweight pitcher in baseball, like no endurance background whatsoever. So it's really, it's really remarkable. I, I got super lucky with EJ for a, for a number of reasons. I mean, we could talk for another whole podcast about his contributions to, to NorCal cycling, how he's like part of NorCal cycling now. It's really incredible. But, um, but yeah, a uh, long winded version is he is going to be a cat two knocking on the door of cat one because the last piece of the puzzle is, um, this thing we talked about in, earlier in the pod, which is like something that's so hard to teach um, without going out and doing it. Um, we have drills. We're going to make videos about it. They're in the master class. I'll pitch my master class one more time. But uh, it's like this this nuance of riding in a pack and positioning yourself, not just for the sprint, but throughout the whole race, right? Like he's wasting a lot of energy not knowing how to position himself correctly because it's, a, you guys know, in a crit, it's, a, it's 500 tiny little decisions that all add up to you being in the right position to, to win the race. I just think it's super interesting because, you know, normally if someone gets into the sport, they're not going to pin a number on for probably the first year of maybe two years of riding their bike. Whereas this guy is like a complete outlier in the sense that he's used racing as a way to actually learn the sport from almost day dot. Like I, I would argue that's pretty damn rare and how this plays out for his overall skill as a bike rider, I'm really interested to see, actually. What is he going to do? So let's say this season he, he gets to Cat 2 uh, and he's racing. I, can, you, can you give him some time off so he can go and <laughs> keep going? Well, there's the off like, season. What do you mean? <laughs> well, like if suddenly he's... he's, he's like, well, yeah. If we go through, go if he, you know, goes through this season, then goes through next off season, you know, and he's at four hundred watts. Okay, you are, you, there's a genetic component, so you don't know where that's going to stop. But let's say it he gets to four hundred watt threshold with a sixteen hundred watt sprint. <laughs> like, it would be very interesting to see him go and race the elite races isn't it, and the isn't it pro exciting? It's and, I, I don't know, I'm sitting back with the cool. popcorn too. Like, yeah. how far can this guy go? It's in, it's insane. Like, <laughs> yeah, I had I had faith in the, the the training platform that I developed. Did I ever think in a million years that it would be this successful? Like, no way. Like, EJ's killing it. And um, man, talk about an ambassador for the thing we're building. Um, he is he's uh been fantastic. Like, um. Is it is there is there a conspiracy theory here? I'm just I'm just thinking of one here. Like if 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 I was Jeff, right? If I'm Jeff, I get this random quote unquote. Oh God! Guy you're from, you're from my YouTube a comments. I know you. Pitcher <laughs> slash former, you know, Polish triathlon <laughs> national champ that no one ever knows about or something, and he just suddenly has a 400 watt FTP. Very clever, Jeff. <laughs> Very clever. Oh, God, the number happening. of comments I have gotten, you guys can probably imagine about... Really? About how, Brilliant. Yeah, about how we're faking <laughs> it or like how people are, are twisting themselves into pretzels trying to figure out anything anything except well, maybe <laughs> I should do structured training and, and uh, you know, maybe the discipline works <laughs> and... Before all of that, it's, oh, no, they're telling a fib. Just like, it's mm. all here. It's all public for you guys to see. It's pretty funny. I I played into it because I did a video saying he was oh, fucking we, dreaming we thinking that. he's going to get we to 380. <laughs> <laughs> and then, not because, only because there's probably literally one in a... 20,000 oh, people I, that I'm, could actually do that <laughs> just purely on the numbers. And he has. It doesn't mean it's not absolutely, possible. It's absolutely. Absolutely. Highly I, unlikely. I would have said the same thing, to be honest, because I have made this very clear. I am I am not making the claim that, hey, anybody who buys the NorCal Cycling Masterclass is going to progress at the same rate as EJ because yeah. I'd, be, I'd be misrepresenting yeah. what's possible. Part of it is, first of all, you have to follow the structure that I outlined. EJ has done that to a T. That's part of it. But also, like, you have to have the genes in order to respond. Everybody's different, right? I didn't 
start racing last year and become a Cat 1. EJ might do that. That wasn't me. It took me a decade to figure this out. And that was part of the reason I developed the course is to try to fast track that. But not everyone's going to do it at EJ, right? If I'm on one end of the spectrum, it took me a decade. It took EJ one year. Most other people are going to probably fall in between somewhere if they're lucky. Some people, they might hit, you know, a 320 watts and that's all that their blood is is able to uh, adapt to the training. You know, that's all their muscle fibers. Are, that's the, the most that they can do. Um, I don't have to tell you, Jesse, you're a coach. You know how this works. But yeah, uh, EJ is a, um, a, a freak of nature for a lot of different reasons. But one of them is his ability to adapt to training stress. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, th so the other stream of comments was like, oh, I don't really like this because it's not realistic. I'm like, yeah, but that's why people want to watch because it's just like, yeah. it's like a science experiment. It's not realistic. Something most of us will never get to is. experience. This that's is what makes this is realistic. Cool. It's, it's, yeah, it's, he's skewed off to one side of being able to, but I got the same, I got, I got all those comments. Absolutely. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, tell him to stop improving? Like, what do, what do you expect me to do? Hey, don't be so good, EJ. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Don't be so good. Yeah. Yeah. But he's yeah. still figuring it out. I mean, That's right? We talked about this already. There's nuance to racing that goes beyond what can you smash for 20 minutes or what can you just crank out um, in, in a 10-second sprint. And he figured that out. It took him to cat threes. He kind of just brute forced his way through the lower categories. And now he's at a point where it's like, ooh, I can't just go out and do that thing that I that I do at 450 watts anymore, right? I have to... <laughs> I actually have to be a little bit more clever about how I'm using my energy. And and this is going to this is going to make him better in the long term cuz um he has to develop those skills now. Do you think he'll become like a long-term so. cyclist? Yeah, he's very very like, interested in the sport. Yeah. Um this isn't about the the views or the or the the internet, the YouTube clout for him. It's he loves the sport. In fact, the whole thing was his idea. Like if, if you guys caught the very first episode, we talk a little bit about it, but he was my videographer editor and he was 256 pounds or something like that. And then um, I was like, yeah, I was thinking about bringing back Couch to Crit season two. That was a lot of fun. It was really rewarding. I think it brought a lot back to the community. And then he's like, you know, put me in coach. <laughs> I was like, right, really? Yeah, I'm sitting here on I the am. Couch. And I was yeah. like, well, okay, you got to commit to it. And he was, um, he did wholeheartedly he's a, he's a very dedicated um individual that's for sure and all all of his endeavors so uh i'm proud of the guy i think i think he's going to make a good run of it and um i only hope that it brings him all the satisfaction that this sport has brought me awesome all right i might do a quick outro and go from there unless we need there's a, anything we else run an we run an intro too awesome. you said at the end because you get the topics or um, I'll probably oh, do that off perfect. camera just because then I can work out exactly. I can't even Fair remember enough. what we talked about. So, yeah. Um, um, all right. Thank you so much for your time today, Jeff. I'd love to get yourself, maybe, and EJ back on here in a future date. But until then, thank you again for your time, Jeff. Love what you guys are doing. Thanks for having me on. Jesse, I will see you very soon.